Sorry. Now I'm on. Color coordinated here. All right. So we're going to go about an hour and 45 minutes. And No, I'm kidding. I think we, we did last night. And Jimmy, I appreciate it. <laughs> I thought your last 30 minutes was the best 30 minutes. Huh? It's good. We got into it. I can't do that. I'm not strong enough in the Scripture to stand up here and know how to do that. I couldn't, I couldn't do it for, for love or money. So, now we're talking about Christian the evidences, I guess. The uh, fact that Christ was prophesied about ever since the beginning, as Jimmy talked like this last night. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning. First thing before we get into our lesson today, did you all see the uh, Supreme Court ruling concerning the coach out in Kansas, I think, or Oklahoma was it Kansas? You know, he's been in a lawsuit, huh? And so yeah, he's been in a lawsuit about five years or seven with a school that fired him because he was silently having prayer and inviting anybody that wanted to after the ball games. Now, whether you are a believer or non-believer or who, whom you are, I do think, that, and I would argue this, that the freedom, and that's what they kind of came down on, freedom of speech. You know, if you want to pray, I think you should be able to pray. If you don't, if you don't want to pray... The same rights give you the fact to say you don't want to pray. But to come down on somebody to say they can't, if they're trying to force somebody, that's a totally different issue. But I was proud to see that they stood up for all of our rights because lots of times it appears that we have to give up rights to, to, the, to one side or the other so that you find the middle. But I think they found the middle. Today was... You know, if you want to pray, pray. If you don't want to pray, don't pray. But you should have the right to if you choose to. Just don't force it. So I'm tickled that they did that. I thought it was a good, a good ruling. So back to our lesson. So I'm going to ask you all a question, and I want you to interact with me uh, because that's the way I want to conduct class. It's just I want some interaction, if you will. I'd appreciate it, in other words. First thing, somebody... Go over and find Isaiah 53, which I know everybody understands. Isaiah 53 and probably could quote a lot of it, but go to Isaiah 53. Somebody get that and be ready to read it here in a minute. So I'm going to ask you the question. In the beginning, let us create man in our own image. We talk about being three in the Godhead. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I think we have a hard time, as a general rule, when we get to thinking about it, we, we, we want to put them together, but then we want to take them apart. So as I've grown up in the church almost all my life, or all my life, but you know, I've tried to figure out a way to separate the three in my head, and I'm going to expound a little on that tonight, but I want to, you know, as we talked about, there's over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that talk about them being able to recognize Christ when He came. So I'm going to ask you as much as anything tonight for us to separate those three. I want to separate God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want us to concentrate on the separation of those because I think for the prophecies to come down about Christ, it's very important for us to separate His role and why and, why and how they should have been able to recognize. And I think they just chose not to as a general rule. As Jimmy said, there was what from Palm Sunday, Jimmy, to the crucifixion, about 30 different 
prophecies that came true that, that were that were fulfilled. So and Christ spoke a lot in parables about tearing down the church and he would rebuild it in three days and just so many things that we see that are repetitive in the Bible. So again, in the beginning, God creating the heavens and the earth. And Jimmy, you talked also last night about he stretched his hands out over the deep and the waters. And when you said that, I thought, so what's the two things basically in the in in the Bible that it talks about that is life giving? And I would say water and blood. When they pierced Christ's side, the water and the blood mixed. The water gives life, all the round rivers and all the things gives life because everything has to have water. But God also said the life is in the blood, the power is in the blood. So water and blood give life. Can you imagine, and, and we've all kind of, I guess, in our lifetime, sat around and planned out. We planned out this vacation Bible school. We planned out building this building. You plan out anything that you pretty much do. You plan out a vacation. You plan out whatever it might be. So God had a plan when He created the world. And His Son being, again, we kind of put them together right here. Right here they're together. He said, let us create them in our image. So we put them together. But Christ, from the beginning of time, knew that in the fullness of time, He would have to come and purchase the church. Now can you really imagine that? Can, you, can we wrap our heads around that? That He knew from the day of the beginning of time, and, we, and Jimmy, as Jimmy spoke last night, we have a hard time separating ourselves. I don't know if we have the capacity to understand what time was before there was time. But in the beginning, Christ knew what a weight that would be all of your all the time that the world existed knowing that at some point in time you're going to come to earth and to live and then to be crucified so again somebody will read Isaiah 53 for me because this is what Christ knew Mm -hmm. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, and man of sorrow, acquainted with secret grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried, it was our sorrows that made him known. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God. Yeah, when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many to 
I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. Thank you. So, when they would read that, or when he knew that was, that was in the Old Testament. That was prophesied many years before he was ever born. He realized this is how they were going to treat him. Now, I know that I can kind of buck up and hold my hold my temper every now and then, and sometimes I can't. But just think about the fact that how falsely accused he was of everything. So I think we still have this grandeur idea that Christ was come and about every picture that we see, every actor that we see, or everybody, even on the chosen here. And I think they did a wonderful job, but I think that they always over make Christ look good. <laughs> I'm talking about physically. I'm not talking about spiritually or or I think they did a wonderful job on the on the chosen of how how he controlled everything that he needed. You know, he was in control. He was in control because he knew he was in control. But I think that he was ugly in whatever way. He wasn't. It says he wasn't. It wasn't like he came to be a rock star. It wasn't like he came to that everybody was going to think, well, he's the best looking guy around, and we're all going to follow him, and we're all going to do this and that. You know, it's kind of like the ugliest guy walks in the room and he's charged with getting everybody to follow him or the guy with the whatever the, the least appearance however you want to say it I think we I think we over in our mind or I do it's kind of like I never kind of realize of how probably unappearing he would be until he started teaching until he, it was it was what he did, not what he looked like, not how he did. I mean, it was how he did, but it wasn't it wasn't that everybody was going to follow him just because. Now, the charismatic, I can't imagine that he wasn't charismatic in the sense of that he was in so good a control of everything that he did. But he knew they were going to do all these things. We've studied in the last two or three Wednesday nights, we've been doing a... A, a series of just kind of what ifs and going back through and brain teasers. You know, was Christ Melchizedek? Was that was that he? Well, did he come then? Jimmy, you talked about him coming as the three wise men or the three men, the three angels, the three people that probably you know that you thought that, that was that the way I understood you last night to say you you thought that two of them went on to Sodom and Gomorrah and that Christ was there. Yeah. So, it's not like he didn't have interaction, more than likely. It's not like he didn't have the ability to come and to do. So wonder, and again, these are just brain teaser things to, to me. To wonder what Christ was like. Was that was there? <laughs> I want some feedback to this, because I don't know the answer. I don't know if you scripturally say what the answer was. Was there a time when he took on human form and was born as a baby that he didn't know? Is there a time, you know, as as born as us being born? I can remember back when I was about four and a half years old. I can remember four, maybe four and a half. But I can't remember anything past that. And was Christ that way or not? Did he have a gap in his life that he just didn't that he didn't know as a baby? I don't know. What's anybody else's opinion on that? I think that he was human. I believe he was completely human, just like us. If that's so, he had the same life we did. So yes, his early years, no child's early years are they going to remember. As they grow up, there's going to be a certain time before a period, a point of your life, be a time before that that you are not going to carry with you. Maybe little bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. Well, you start remembering more and more of it as you go, yeah. There's going to be a point after that. Like I'm sure most everybody in here, no matter what their age is, that maybe something happened in the first grade. Mm -hmm. I can remember things that happened in my first grade. Mm -hmm. That's been a lot of years ago. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. No, it is, but we can still remember back that far. So I'm saying, yeah. So is there was there three or four years in Christ's life that he was lost in the fact that he was God, but he was man here? I mean, I don't know. I'm just asking what you all think because I think we do need to figure out that there was a separation between God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And each one of them have a separate role to play. And we have to separate them for them to be able to do their role. I think that's what this lesson's all about. That if we don't separate them, they cannot do their role. Well, we know the Luke phase where that's the third time he you know, was marked and he had a mm -hmm. in the temple. We know at least at that point he knew who he was. He knew who he was. You kind of think about, you know, as a kid, when do you start to know who you are? Like from becoming of age to understand I have sin in my life and I need to confess and repent. So I think it probably was different for just like it's different for all of us. I mean, we realize that it was probably just a variant for him as well. I just, I just have always thought it was remarkable to think what's the first time he touched. He maybe he just touched something in it and he came back to life or something. I don't know. I wonder what's the first time he realized that he was God, that he really was. And I don't know. I don't know if that's too deep or too whatever. I think what you're saying. When they asked him what he was doing, he said, I'm about my father's. Why would you not think this is where I'm at? I'm about my father's business. Yes, I, I agree with John Wesley. I think it's from what we know from Scripture, you know, we're to believe that in that 11 to 12-year-old timeframe, but I, I, I agree with John 100%. When he's three, four, five, six, seven, I think he's a boy. He's a boy. And then there's a time, there's a time, yeah. you see references, you know, when he gets to be 11, 12, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I do too. I'm just saying that, you know, yeah. But I mean, but, to, but that really gives you a sense of separation. That makes you understand that, that there was a complete separation between God the Father and God the Son. And I think the next place and kind of, where we'll end up tonight, basically, is that separation happened again when He hung on the cross and bore our sins. Because then He was separated because His Father couldn't look up on sin. And so it was the, the next separation. So if He was, I wouldn't say separated, but if He was in a sense of growing up and not understanding who He was until He became of age to understand who He was, and if we really believe that that's probably common sense the way we would think he was a person on, he was a human being on earth, then he was somewhat separated from his father then, even though he's probably watching over him. And, but, but at the same time, not again until he was fulfilled, until the prophecies were fulfilled, that he was hung on the cross, that he was separated again from God, from his father, because he wanted to do the will of his father. And I totally agree with you. I'm just saying if we if we think about him being there with him in the beginning, at some point in time it's like, okay, son, it's time for you to go be born. I mean, he you know, I think he's an a 
a being in heaven that He was there in the beginning and He came back and forth in different forms during the Old Testament. But then at some point in time, He's like, okay, it's time for you to go be born. And, and it may be just like that to Him, but at the same time, at some point in time, if you can't remember four or five years of your, until you're five or seven years old or whatever, you know what I'm saying. That's what I'm trying to say is there's a... Because it's like we're going to go take a journey and I'm not going to be... I'm not going to be remembering or whole or whatever you want to say until I'm of age. So I'm just saying if we separate that, uh, kind of completely separate that and understand that in some form or fashion or get that in our head, uh, maybe that, we, that, that He came as man because I think we still have a hard time really realizing that He came here as man because I think that's the one thing that, that humbles us more than anything else we would do is realizing that He was man here and that He had the choice to sin. You know, I still think, and well, maybe, maybe this is just the way I think, but it's, I, I have to stop and re- remember that He could have sinned. He just didn't sin. And if any one of us couldn't sin or, had, or was sinless, then we wouldn't have to have Christ. And all these animal sacrifices wouldn't have to have been made because they were not able to forgive sin. So, you know, the next thing I go to kindly, and I read this this afternoon, read all four accounts of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you know, the one in Luke 22 here is the one that, that says that an angel came to him to comfort him. You know, all of them says that he that he was sorrowed to the point of death. But to me, the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's came here and he's lived, he's gathered his apostles up, he's taught them the best he can. They still don't understand. They think it's going to be an earthly kingdom, not a not a heavenly kingdom. He's still got a lot of teaching to do to them with them, but he's done all he can do. And just like what the what it said there a while ago in, in what she read, his life's cut short. Uh, Jimmy, I think you brought this out times and times again that, that in the Jewish religion and everything, the 30-year-old is about the time that, that <coughs> they consider themselves able to be fully. And that's why I probably started his ministry at 30. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. So again, he's hitting the marks of he's twelve or thirteen, like you said, Stephen, and and then from there till he's thirty, you know, he's still growing and doing and being a man here on earth, being a carpenter, having a trade. Then at thirty years old, he becomes a a teacher, a rabbi, a priest in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of uh, the lineage of the Old Testament. Uh, not, not, he didn't have a lineage to be in that order. He in, in a different order, in the order, like it said, uh, totally different than that. He, he, wasn't, he, he didn't trace his lineage back to say, I, would, I was born to be a priest. And it's in the order of Melchizedek that says he, so it's a different order, it's a different way, but he's still following all these things. So for three years, he's teaching. And he continues to teach, and as she read a while ago, he gets treated good sometimes and bad sometimes. But he never deserved the bad, he always deserved the good because he never brought anything but good to anybody. You know, even, even when he brought bad, it was a it was just a, a deserving of of you know like when he fixed the whip and run them out of the synagogue, you know he they needed it. It was righteous indignation because they were doing wrong. He knew the hearts of men. He understood when they were trying to be deceitful. He understood when they were trying to trick him. He understood they had asked him a question. 
you know, should you get the ox out of the ditch on the Sabbath, you know? And he said, no, can I not decide? Would you not? Would you not help? I mean, in other words, if you're a true Christian, would you not want to help any day? Why, why should it be, you know, am I not? And, and every time they would ask him, and like, you know, they, they called it heresy or blaspheming when he'd say that I'm in, the, I'm in authority. I can make this choice. And I'm showing you all what I want you to do. I'm not being a respecter of days. I'm not being a respecter. I'm, I'm loving everyone that, that I'm coming in contact with. And I'm trying to show you this love. So again, you know, we've got all these evidences. Now, the name Jesus. Was there other people named Jesus this time? Was, wasn't it? Jesus, or they, it, you know, there's other people. Other people claim to be. So, again, you had at least 300 times that it pointed to Him being the Savior. At least 30 times it pointed to Him in a week. So now let me ask you this. Let's go back to this. If that was the case, and there was all the, all this prophecy, and you could read it, and these people that were supposed to understand and supposed to be looking for, why did they not want to find Him? I think then you go back to why they crucified Him. By why did they not want to find Him? Why did they not recognize Him when He was here? Why, why did they not? Why do you all think they didn't recognize Him? Thought He'd be an earthly kingdom like David and thought He'd be a powerful soldier. Back under their thumb, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. And they get them back on top again. And then when you have somebody that is as meek as Jesus, um, and as uh, was read earlier there in Isaiah 53, uh, he had no earthly form that anybody would, would want to follow. He wasn't like Saul. He wasn't real tall like we're told Saul was. He didn't have the good appearance that King David had. Uh, he was just, in my eyes, he was just a pity. <laughs> he looked like everybody else. There's mm -hmm. nothing there that stood out about him whatsoever. But we also know that somebody doesn't have to have an appearance to stand out. The way somebody carries himself speaks tremendous of him. Um, there about two months ago, Wilson had a lesson for us, and uh, and we were talking about appearances in that in that particular lesson. And I made a statement during that lesson. I said, you know, I said, you can cover a whole lot of ugly with fancy clothes. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it doesn't mean anything in that particular sense. I didn't mean anything basically uh, physical. They could actually have a very attractive appearance. But the way that their actions are, the way that they talk, the way you know, that, that they act. And I think that's what drew people to Jesus. The, mm -hmm. His true followers, that's what drew him. And of course, when he was able to do the miracle, that also uh, testified to who he was. So I think you're right on point, Diane, of what I, my next point of kind of what I was going to see is people. When we deal with people on a daily basis, I think we have one sense of how people treat us. That's one sense. But I will tell you that I think if you really want to get to know somebody, watch how they treat other people. Because you can find somebody, you know, you you have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with them and they may want you always to see, be seen because they're your friend in a positive light. 
But then watch how they treat somebody as, as you interact with them. Maybe go out and eat lunch with them or go work with them or whatever you're doing. I think it's more important to watch how they treat other people that they interact with because that shows the true person. And I think them watching how Christ interacted with other people, especially when we was watching, watching The Chosen, and I thought one of the most powerful parts in the whole uh, series that we were watching was how he, how he treated Mary Magdalene when she went back to her sinless sin ways and then everybody was scared that he was going to, his wrath was going to come down on her when she came back. They went to get her. He sent, you know, he sent, he sent, so Peter and Matthew to go get her. Is it Peter and Matthew or James? Was it Peter and Matthew? Peter and Matthew. He did that on purpose because he knew they weren't necessarily, he knew they needed a better bond. So everything he did, he did in a way that brought everybody together. But, but he, but when they got her back, Everybody was just kind of, you know, upset. What's he going to do? What's his wrath going to look like? Is he going to bring? You know, they'd already asked him to bring fire down from heaven and kill other people. So was this going to come down? Was he going to just shake her to the core? Was he going to just burn her up? Was it? What was he going to do? Because they realized he had that power. Well, what did he do? He said, "I just want your heart. I want you to love me. I want you to love me the way I love you." And that's all He wants from any of us. He just wants us to love Him the way He loves us. And that's so hard for us to kind of get wrap our mind around. It's not so hard. It's just simply giving in to saying, I'll love you the way you love me. Reciprocating love. But I think the whole image of all, those, all the apostles, I think, changed when He saw, they saw how kind He was to her. How loving He... They were waiting outside the tent. And you know, we don't know if that's exactly the way it happened, but who, who says it wasn't? But he was, they were waiting to see how His wrath came down on her. Because He knew that however He treated her was how they could be treated. But He didn't come down on her like shook her to her core, shook her to her bones. He said, I just want your heart. And so everything that we don't deserve, all the meanness that they've lumped on Christ the whole time, the reason He's the perfect gift that He is is because He can set all that aside and sees the bigger picture. He understands that the only way we get to heaven is for Him to carry that torch. So then he comes back to the Garden of Gethsemane and he goes and he prays. He says, I've known this. Just think about this. I've known this since the beginning of time, Jimmy. Or he said, I've known that I had to do this from the time that you cre we created the world. From the time we created it, I've known that I was going to have to do this. But now that I'm here, I'm going to ask you, is there any other way? Can you not let this cup pass from me? Do I have to do this? That's the power of that. The powerful, huh? That's what I'm saying, the humanity of it. But at the same, huh? That's exactly what you're saying. He showed his humanity in that he knew as a human what he was going to have to go through. Exactly. But, but, but I want to go one step further than that. If, if, if they captured one of us and did that to us, we can't call ten legions of angels down. <laughs> he still had the ability to sin, really. He still had the ability to say, I can't take it and, and, and just poof and be gone. None of us have that ability. So not only does He show the humanity of it, He also shows self-discipline, self-control, because He had control when, when, cut, when Peter cuts off the guard's ear and He says, nah, if you're going to live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. He picks His ear up and puts it back on. He said, do you not think that I can call ten legions of angels down and take care of myself? 
But we can't do that. We, have, we need Him. We need Christ to get to heaven. But He could, not only was He human in that sense, but He also had the power to change it if He wanted to. But He had to exercise self-discipline not to do that too. Sure, sure. What I'm saying, yeah, we would. So, in about the next two minutes here, what I would wrap up to say is, is in our life, and we come here and we study and we and we do and and we should and, and we're commanded to do. But just always remember, we're probably doing more evangelizing. Spreading the good news that we don't have on the wall right now. <laughs> we don't usually do. By the way we treat other people than by what we say. It's probably by what we do. Just like by what He did, He was converting people. But then He went to the cross and after all of these things, after knowing that in the beginning He was going to have to do it, He willingly hung on that cross and was separated from His Father, so that through His blood, because Christ, God's not going to look up on sin. Unless we're washed in His blood, we're not going to come in the presence of God. That's the separation. And then when you talk about, and I didn't talk much about the separation of the Holy Spirit, you know, like He's the Comforter. He's the, he's the one that says, you know, that the Holy Spirit came and ascended Upon the apostles, you know, it, it's it was a known thing when he came to do that. The Holy Spirit has a big heart, big part to play. Also, I really think that, you know, so real quickly, I think that, and this is just Sean for sure saying this, but God was here and walked and talked with man through the early part of the Bible. Christ came on the scene probably a few different times, possibly. But he came on the scene and he purchased the church. And then he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come back. But when he left, he sent the Comforter, he sent the Holy Spirit so that the world is never left alone. We are never left. The Comforter, the Holy Spirit's here, that he's with us and... Through Him, we can pray and do and then intercede. Christ intercedes for us. But without all three of them having a equal, or a, I say equal, a part to play, 
to make all of this come together so that in judgment, Christ's blood can cleanse our sins so that God, so that in the presence of God, we can then be seen. Because we can't see God with sin. Because God can't look upon sin. And we would want God to look upon us and say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. So He can only do that if we have Christ's blood on us that cleanses us. But He had to be separated from His Father so that we could all be together with His Father. <laughs> so that's... Go ahead. Again, that goes back to the humanity of what... And that's what and that's what I yeah, and that's what I was saying. He he knew that he would have to be divided from, he would have to they would be separated. So you have to separate them. If they don't separate, the the prophecies do not follow if they don't separate. So that's what I'm saying. Every time we think, can we take them apart? Can we not? They have to come apart for us to be for it all to be whole. So they had to they had to be separated so that we would have the opportunity to to be uh, connected. Go ahead. But before he did that, <clears throat> have you ever thought about John was there, the only apostle? But have you ever thought about why he left his mother in the care of John? Sure. All right. His brothers did not believe. They weren't believers at that time. But yeah. During those 40 days, when Jesus came back before Pentecost, he went to James. I think Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians somewhere. And I'll see he appeared to. 500 at one time, and he also appeared to James, his mm -hmm. brother, mm -hmm. uh, the other guy, you know, mm -hmm. and he became one of the pillars of the sure. church. But, you know, it's just all that has so much detail to it. But, John, but Christ being the firstborn, it was his responsibility to assign his mother, somebody to take care of his mother because his father was dead. No, I understand, but that's what I'm saying. But it was his responsibility to assign somebody to take care of his mother. So again, there he is, the humanity of all of it, that he's got brothers and sisters, he's got all this. But yet, he's got this bigger role to play that he understands, and the rest of them don't. <laughs> you know, it, it reminds me, I will tell you this it does remind me, it goes all the way back and reminds me as much of anything as Joseph in the Bible, because Joseph realizes he's got a, part to, a bigger part to play, and his brothers don't. <laughs> huh? Well, that's what, and, and even though we know that he's not sinless, there's never a recorded sin of Joseph in the Bible. And I think that has something, you know, just uh, it's interesting to think about that. All right, lesson yours. Thank you all.